So welcome to OP244. My name is Fardad. Hopefully you remember from last time in the lab. Uh, today we're going to start our OP244. Um, uh, I have prepared your first workshop almost. So I'm going to bring it up, the draft one, and I'm going to actually post it. So it's going to be draft, but you can start working on it. Well, we're going to finalize it as you are, uh, you are working, and probably that's going to be the case every time because these are all new workshops, so I, I, I am designing it as we are going through it. So if um, uh, you see it's draft, you have to keep updating and make sure that you, you, you are always looking at the latest thing. So um, uh, let me open up the, uh, the project at the same time. So. The reason that I'm starting it with workshop, because you know this, you've already done this in, OP, in IPC 144, and I think we should remove this workshop altogether, because you guys know this. This, is for, this the workshop is designed for the time that you didn't do modular programming. You've all had multiple files with header files, right? Okay? All right. So it probably it's a good thing to, to, for me to kind of see how, you, how well you remember organizing your code from... Um, IPC 144, but let me uh, just bring up the dev part of the thing. So um, the workshop is essentially this. So um, compiling modules. I'm going to go through modules, OK? Um, oh. Again, submission policy, the things that I mentioned in class. So 30% is the in-lab, 35% is at home, 35% is do-it-yourself. Um, so essentially, you have, you have, uh, you have um, in in-lab, you have uh, w1inlab.cpp. So if you open that one, the program runs like this. Okay. The program runs like this. I made a few changes in it, so it's not exactly like what we had last semester. So it's, it has a little bit more bells and whistles in it. So um, that's the Senegraph thingy that you had. Uh, also, see, there is, a, there, is, there is a bug over here that I have to fix. Um, let me... Um, let me run the program again. Was that a bug or is resizing the window? Just a second. Edit. It's just uh, for some reason it's coming out. Not the way I expect. There you go. The width is supposed to be 80. Or even 100. Okay, let me try it one more time. See if it's going to work or it's going to be bad. Now this is good now. Okay, so the, site, the thing wasn't set properly. So it's something like this. It's a program that draws a graph based on uh, the number of uh, values that you're entering for whatever. Okay, let's say I want to know what are the uh, like different sections of IPC 144. I want to know what is the number of students based on semesters. So so when I, I put the in, in number of samples, uh, so, so I'm going to have three samples to check. Then I'm going to say enter the sample. So it's going to ask for three samples. Let's say first we had 120. Then uh, for the next semester we had 200. And last semester we had 90. Then I'm going to say draw the graphs for this. And it draws the graphs for it. So that's the, the, those are the graphs. And then you go uh, zero and it exits. This is uh, one single program, OK? A uh, big one with all the things that you see, the uh, uh, prototypes and the functions that you see over there. And we ask you to separate this into different files. With header files, we tell you exactly which uh, 
file contains what um, function, so which header file, which prototypes to, goes to which header file, then you create the files separately and you compile them, and it should run exactly the same thing. You are not coding at all. You're just moving the, cop the copying the code into proper places. That's all you do. And then you compile and you send it to us. It should run exactly uh, how it ran right now. Okay? That's in lab. For the at home, we tell you to add the safeguards and uh, add bells and whistles for it and make it the way it's supposed to be. Okay? That's the, uh, the at home part. So, um, so essentially, the at home part works like this. Uh, so where is the at home? So the at home part, I added the citation and resources to the, to all sections of OOP244, which means if you get the code from anyone for anything that you do in Seneca in, in your OOP244 courses, uh, you have to mention, and if it's not, you have to mention that you did not. So you kind of sign that this is my work. Or this part and this part, I got it from someone else. So they're all here. You're going to be adding it to your submission. Um, Late submission policy, you can read it later on. I just want to go to the at home part. So for at home part, essentially, it's asking you to uh, set up your computer. So this is the lab thingy that we have done together, but you're going to do it again. So um, this is the in lab. Um, so you run and compile that thing, and then you separate it into different uh, 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 files, compile them separately one by one, and then compile them together like this. Um, and you run it, it should work the same way. How to submit it, I'm changing that one too, so uh, that's going to be announced. Um, then prepare your computer for OP244 subject. These are the, the YouTube videos that I put over there to install Git, Schmidt, all the things, install uh, 2019. If uh, you have anything other than a Windows computer, for those people with Apple, Macintosh, or uh, uh, Linux machines, please install a virtual machine, Windows 10, and go through it. If you have those machines, you know how they are done. Um, you can go download VMware. VMware runs on all, the, all these machines, and you can run them and uh, install Windows 10 on it. Uh, the subject runs on Windows 10 and Visual Studio. If you're working on those, I cannot help you with setup, OK? Uh, you can do the project. Uh, if you know perfectly how to work with Xcode, for example, do it on, on, on your Apple, no problem. But you cannot come and say, it doesn't compile. Because I cannot, like, it, it doesn't compile, and I look at it, and I see it's not a code-based thing. You don't know how to set up a project in Xcode. I can't help you with that, because I don't know, OK? Uh, the ad hope submission, again, to be announced. The do it yourself. What do it yourself is essentially this. So uh, I have done the exact same thing. So for do it yourself, there is a program called phone directory. And this phone directory is essentially a phone directory, OK? I wanted to add more features to it, but then I say, why do I do that? I just want to test your thing, so your, uh, your abilities on that. So as you see, this one only has one prototype over here. It has a structure. And because functions are ordered in proper way, there are no prototypes, OK? It runs just like this. So you're going to be responsible to actually copy the name of the function and put it as prototype in a header file that it's needed, OK? So you've got to set all those things yourself. So I'll give you this file, and I'll tell you I want it to be in contacts.cpp, contacts module, file module, phone directly module, and tools module. So four modules you're going to have. So you're going to spread this into four modules, and you're on your own. I'm not going to tell you how. I'm not going to. The only thing I need, when I say a module, it means CPP and H. I'm not going to tell you that on the workshop. So I'm going to say separate it in four modules. And the one that is main in it, it doesn't need a header file. So the phone directory itself, it doesn't need header file. The rest of them do. Um, so I'm not going to tell you how, because you have done it for the other one. So you do it all on your own, OK? And you submit it the exact same way like the other one. The phone directory runs. It actually goes through uh, a file. And so it's going to be a, a phone directory like this. So you can uh, list the files. <coughs> oh, list the, the, the directory of people who are in there. 
So there are a few names over there originally. You can add phone record to it. You can search for it. You can sort it. You can save it um, in the file. Uh, and it loads it from the file automatically. And so uh, all these things, you can do it with this one. So um, you have to put it in modules, and it should work exactly like this one. Again, no coding involved. You have the coding is just creating that prototypes. That's all, and nothing else. The only thing you need to do is that when you create a module, you bring the functions into the CPB file. You add the, you put, your friend is over there. Yeah, yeah, so, so. Uh, so what happens is that you put all the, all the files in, uh, all the functions in the file, and then you create the prototypes into the header file with the same name and add the safeguards and everything. If you don't know what safeguards are in the, in the thing, it, I created a, uh, a YouTube video that tells you how the compiler works. You're supposed to know that from IPC144, but look at that, it tells you exactly how compiler works with a demonstration and everything. So look at that and create your safeguards. Remember, our school is now, it's gonna take a while for me to remember the name. I actually mentioned it somewhere over here that our school is this, and you have to do that. Uh, yeah, please note that the school name is changed. The name of our school is School of Software Design and Data Science. And therefore, we write our code under the namespace SDDS. You don't know what a namespace is? You're going to find out today. OK? All right. Uh, any questions about the workshop? Remember, you are supposed to do the in-lab. In-lab is actually submission in-lab, not do it in-lab. Do it at home. Find out how it's done. Make sure everything works so you come to lab prepared. And if you have your GitHub account created, you can actually push it in GitHub, come to the lab, and pull it from GitHub. Maybe you can do that. Or put it on your memory stick or whatever you're happy with. Hello. Any questions down to here? Any questions one? Any questions two? All right. So let's start. Close solution. Create a new project. The project I'm creating is an M. So the pro if you keep doing that, it's going to tell you which one it is. So you don't have to run, search through it on your own machines. But at school, every single time, you have to go look for that empty project C++ thingy that we have. So that's what we are creating. So essentially, it's this one. Uh, it goes up and down quite, quite fast. So which one is empty? There you go. Um, C++ Windows Console, empty project, so that's the one. Next, always have this one checked. Select the directory in which you want to create it. I want to create an OP244 in this one, but let me first pull it to make sure everything's in there first. So I'm going to first pull it right from here. Make sure that it's updated and synced with the repository that we have. And it was not actually, I have some stuff over there. So I got those things, and I'm going to say close. So now it's pulled. Now I'm going to go in there and create the new one. So select folder. It's going to be 04. And this is September 6th, right? September 6th, section AB. Are we okay with this? All right. And I'm going to say create. And three years later, it's going to create the, the project for me. Then, as usual, I'm going to add a source file over here so everything can begin. Add new item, program.cpp. I am doing this now. I'm going to do it for, for a couple of weeks. After that, I'm going to prepare it and bring it over here. So I just open up the thing, so I don't have to do it every single time. But I do it a few times, so you'll see exactly how it's done. So include IO stream. Not header, it is a header file, but you don't put .h for it, OK? And then you're going to say using namespace std int main return 0, OK? That's the beginning of what I want to do. And I compile and run it. 
to make sure everything's okay. It compiles it and it works perfectly, right? A program that does nothing. All right. Any questions down to here? All right. Next, let's bring up the timeline to see what we are going to actually talk about. Again, what you see over here usually helps me to go through the topics that I want to talk about, but there are several things that I do not mention, and there are many things that I mention that it's not in there, okay? So, your college students, it is not supposed to be exactly like that. You're supposed to do research. You're just supposed to go study and find out how things work. So, please do so, and come with questions all the time, okay? And if you see two screens, it's not double vision. That's the way they set it up. I have no idea why. Probably they want to merge it one day to one big screen. I don't know. <clears throat> All right. Welcome to Object Oriented. All right. Have you heard of Object Orientation? You know what? Did, anything about it? Zilch? Zero? Who, who heard about Object Orientation? Who, who can tell me, like, like your five-year-old comes in, what is Object Orientation? What were you going to tell the, the, uh, the kid? No? Good. Let's do it. OK. <clears throat> Beautiful. I'm, I'll come to you. OK, so you, can add, you cannot answer now, but you will answer eventually, right? So I will come to you. And I'm going to put that random thingy up there so it shows the name of the next person every single time I hit it. So you, you, it's going to come up. So, so we're going to do that. You have done programming, and what we have done was modular programming, which means we actually wrote programs based on the criteria that our application was supposed to do. So we knew our application is supposed to do this and that, and we create our modules based on that. So anything that dealt with files, we put it in a file. Anything that dealt with a contact, we put it in a contact. Anything that dealt with a phone directory, we put it in a phone directory. Anything that did not relate to anything else, and it was a general thing, we put it in a file called tools, right? So like that, uh, we can organize our stuff. And each one has it had its own header file to tell to other programs what are we dealing with here? All right? So, in an object-oriented world, the story is a little bit different. We learned about structures. What does a structure do, my friend? What did you just say? Groups together what? Functions. No functions. We are doing C. Oh, okay. uh, so he knows what is object orientation. I didn't talk about it. All right. So a structure puts one more time. Data types into, type. data types into one specific type. Okay. What does it mean a type? Into one. So essentially, that one data type of ours. One data type of ours, um, it's your turn, my friend. OK, so, so the one data type that we have, uh, do you know what we call that type of a data type? The data type that is built out of other data types? A, a composite type, a, a type that is made out of stuff, OK? Don't be, you are not supposed to know my answer, OK? So when I ask you a question, you have to think about it and try to come up with the right answer. It's, it's highly unlikely that you know the answer because we're talking about a new thing. So when I ask you a question and you see you have no idea, you say, well, I have no idea. That's a good thing to say. That's why you're here. If you knew, you wouldn't have been here, right? So composite types, a types that are built out of other types. So we kind of package stuff. So why did we do that? First, they have done it because they say, OK, I want to carry uh, a notebook and a microphone and a coffee mug and a mouse and stuff like that, and I carry it like that, it doesn't work. I have to put it in a backpack, right? I put everything in a backpack and I carry it around. That was the reason structures were, was, were created. You want to put things, all the things that are related to each other for any reason. You put it in a backpack, you call that backpack as a structure. So you can carry the backpack around and everything comes with you. You don't have to take care of every single thing. If you had fe four features of an entity, 
and you wanted to go through those four features of the entity, you had to create four separate arrays. Then you had to make sure that every single array is related with each other with the corresponding index. That's a headache. Instead of that, you put the four things in one structure. That structure becomes a new data type, a type that contains four types in it. And then you can create one array of that structure. It's like you have 20 backpacks. And each backpack has a laptop in it and a micro. So that's what happens, right? Beautiful. That's good for structured programming. So what is structured programming? It's the modular programming that we are dealing with, which means we essentially uh, base all the things that we do based on events that are supposed to happen. First, you have to enter the name. So, so I'm going to write the get name over here. Then you have to see if the name is the right one. I'm going to write the validation. Now I have to check to see if that thing is in a directory. I'm going to check the directory. So you, you literally wrote the scenario of things that are happening. We call it a use case, which in your case is your assignment description. Too much hand-holding, though. They didn't tell you this. They literally told you, write a function that accepts three arguments. But you were supposed to find that out yourself, that they tell you, OK, I want a uh, 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 a function that receives someone's name and uh, returns someone's name and, and age, then you have to create a function that returns, uh, receives a character pointer for the name and an integer pointer for the age. So you have to design that yourself. We didn't let you do that. But it's bad thing that we have done. We, you should learn to do all these things by yourself. But that's what we have done. So essentially, you go through the scenario and you write the functions accordingly. What does a computer have when you look at a computer? Give me a name. One thing. Memory. Memory. What a computer have? What does it have? Motherboard? <clears throat> okay. La la la. Okay, use your opera voice when you're answering. Look at the size of the thing. If you say, nobody's going to hear you. Loud, OK? Thank you. So keyboard, thank you very much. Do we have a computer without a keyboard? Have you seen a computer without a keyboard? Pardon me? Well, it's a keyboard. So it has a keyboard. You can't say it doesn't have a keyboard. It has a keyboard. It's, it's on the. Yeah, of course. It's like a cell phone. Your cell phone is a computer. Does it have a keyboard? Yes, it does. It comes up when you're texting. Yeah, so it has a keyboard. Do we have a computer that doesn't have a screen? Do we have a computer that doesn't have memory? When I say car, what do you remember? What do you say? What a car has? What does a car have? Wheels. Engine. Steering wheel. Windows. Gearbox, see? So we are going to, actually, this is amazing. Because you see exactly who wants to write a user interface and who wants to write business logic. Those people who say steering wheel, those people who say brake pedal, this is a gas pedal, these are the people who want to write user interface. Those people who say gearbox, engine, these are the people who want to write the business logic. OK? But essentially, you understand the fact that when I, t when I say car, you close your eyes, you can picture a car in your mind, right? That is object orientation. I do not need to tell you that if you have a car, you turn the steering wheel to right, the car is going to move towards right. You know that. Is there any car that you turn right and it goes left, or goes backwards and forward, or accelerates when you do this? No. Hopefully not. <laughs> a broken car. Do you have a car that when you press the gas pedal and it doesn't work? Not a broken car. A functional utopian car. You press the, it stops, right? So all the actions, functions, things that a car do comes with the definition of a car. If I told you, if I told you a driver, a car needs a driver. What, when I say a driver, what do you picture in your mind? A person, right? Hopefully not a dog, right? A person. So it's a person, okay? And this person has capabilities. So it's a human being, 
hopefully, that has, or you have a Tesla that drives itself and you say, no one. But anyways, so if it's a, it's a human being and that human being has the capability of driving and going to place. So, so again, you have a second object that has its own specific rules that can work with the first object that you are dealing with. It could send messages to each other, which means the driver pushes the gas pedal, that is sending a message to car, car receives the message from that thing, it means my gas pedal is pressed, I have to go faster. It goes faster and action is happening. These are objects passing messages to each other. So we don't design our object-oriented program, our object-oriented design based on only events. What we do, we look at what an object is and what it is supposed to do. And when you create an instance of that object, all those things come with it. All cars, when you press the gas pedal, accelerate. It doesn't have to be a BMW or a Honda. They have different rates of acceleration, but they both accelerate. I do not need to mention what this is because I just set a car. So every new instance of car knows how to do its job. That's reusing your code in, in that's not actually reusing your code, that's object orientation. If I have a car, now I can have a BMW, right? If I have a BMW, I can have a BMW 320. If I have a BMW 320, I, have a, I can have a BMW 320 coupe, right? So you can build from the bases that you have. If you want to build a motorcycle, what, do you, what, what is the best way to go to? Like if you want to literally, don't think that I want to make a chopper, and like, like a functional motorcycle. You need, a, you need a bicycle with an engine on it. Done. Right? That's a motorcycle. So you don't have to redesign the whole damn thing. Use another object that is out there that does the thing for you. Then take the bloody object uh, that you have that you want to add to it like an engine, put on it and make it work with it. So essentially, your, your, your motorcycle is a child of a bicycle that has an engine. So if you say it in English, what is a, what is a motorcycle? If you want to explain it again to a six-year-old, because six-year-old doesn't know what is a motorcycle, but, it, but, but she knows what a bicycle is. And I don't know if a, if a, if a six-year-old knows what an engine is, but hey. Anyways, <laughs> you, can say, you can say, what is a motorcycle? A motorcycle is a bike. Is a, uh, the things that I'm saying, please put four more ears on. A motorcycle? is a bicycle that has an engine. Is a, has a. Fardot is a human being who has ears. Fardot not, Fardot is not ears. Fardot has ears, right? So has a means property. The thing that my, my friend said over here, all the things a structure has. So if I say a structure is called student, a student has a student number, right? A student has a name. name. A student has a GPA, right? But a student is a person, right? A teacher is a person, but a teacher has an employee number and courses that he teaches. So as you see, I have the person. So I do not need to say a student has a name because a person has a name. When I think about the student, I'm gonna say student is a person, so everything that a person has, gender, age, um, I don't know, whatever you call it, height, color of hair, languages that it speaks, everything that a, that a person has, comes into a student, and then you continue to build over that. That's reusing your code. All right? Now, we have flying objects, right? Things that fly. Things that fly, and when you think about things that fly, they can fly, they can go up to certain attitude, they can um, 
I don't know, go with certain speed, okay? And now we can have airplanes, right? Airplanes is a flying object that does something. And also we have a pigeon. A pigeon is a flying object too, right? Now, airplane flies, correct? Pigeon flies, correct? Can you tell me how a flying object flies? No. You know a flying object flies. How? You don't know. You have to actually bring it down, make it more specific, make it an airplane, then kind of clarify. It's, it's, you, do, you still don't know if it's a jet or it's a propeller one. You don't know, but you know almost how, uh, how uh, uh, an airplane flies or a helicopter. It has a rotating propeller. They call it rotary wings, right? And a pigeon has wings that it... Okay, so, so they all fry by in different ways. So objects can do the same thing in different ways based on the uh, level of hierarchy and inheritance that they are doing. My father used to teach mechanics. I'm teaching computer science. So I got the teaching gene from my, from my father. But I changed that thing and modified that thing. That's an awful example, by the way. <laughs> I'll tell you why, because that's something that you see it in all books that I have to give you an exam example and tell you that it's an awful thing. Because that hierarchy, like daughter, mother, and, 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 and uh, son and father, that's the worst thing. Because in an object-oriented world, in an object-oriented wor world, a daughter and a mother, mo mother are actually instances of the, of, of the same type, a human female. They are not, one is not inherited from each other. The mother had a function called birth that returned a human being. You follow what I'm saying? And that's reality. If you want to design it, that's the way it's supposed to be. That birth returned a human being, and that human being happened to be a girl or a boy. You follow what I'm saying? So the th they say, me and my father, that's inheritance. It's not. Inheritance is in design, is in classification, not who created what. OK? So remember that. Like, I am a mammal. OK? That's fine. I am a human being. Human being is a mammal. So I can go through that. But I cannot say, like, I I am in, I, I'm inheriting features from my father. That, that doesn't work that way, no. Okay. All right. Now let's put names for those things. Okay? When you design an object, first of all, an object that you create, that's the definition of an object. You have to put things together in an object. The thing that my friend gave away and kind of stole my thunder. Okay? <laughs> what happens is that when, like uh, in C language, you have a structure, and structure has only data in it. You say a student, a student has this, and has that, and has that, and has that. Or you have a teacher, a teacher has a student, uh, employee number, it has number of children, it has salary, things like that, right? It, that's C++. In, that's C. In C++, they add behavior to these. So a teacher has an employee number, and it has a function is in, inside that is called teach. So you can invoke that subject, that, uh, that function. Okay? So putting, adding functions into a structure, adding functions into a structure, and put them together with the attributes, the the, the, the variables that those functions need to work with together is called encapsulation. All right? And encapsulation is completely based on the criteria that you're dealing with. If I, if I have a class called employee, okay? Now listen to this. If I have a class called employee, all right? An employee can work, which means, which means work is a function, correct? An employee has a salary. It means it gets paid a certain amount of money, right? Now, we inherit, the, inherit that employee into an actor and a teacher. Now, for teacher, you don't give a damn if the person is bald. 
But for an actor, you need to know if he is bald or not, if he has hair or not, because based on a part it plays, you need to query those things. So depending on what you are designing, things become important or unimportant. Okay, that's called abstraction. You take the things that you want and you let the things... You, do you care if I dance salsa? Do you? Do you care if I dance salsa? No. No, because I'm a teacher, right? But if I was supposed to be a dancer, do you, did you care if I teach C++? <laughs> no. And we are both human beings, right? Again, depending on what the criteria of the thing is, we put the data and behavior together, and this is called encapsulation. Okay? Encapsulation is to put the data and behavior together. They are the ones that are related to each other. So all the, the variables you create in a structure actually becomes global to the functions inside the structure. So all those functions inside the structure can freely access all the data inside the structure. I should be able to scratch my head, right? That's in me, but I'm not going to scratch his head because he's going to go, what the hell's wrong with you, right? So that's the thing. That's how things happen. And if I feel hungry, he's not going to eat because I'm hungry. We are both objects of type of human, but we have our own properties. I have the amount of nutrition that I take. He has the amount of nutrition that he takes. If he has enough, he's not hungry. If I have enough, if I don't have enough, I am hungry. So that's the beauty of object orientation. You create instances of the same object that you design, and you say, shoo, they all work. Because they all know how to work. They all have private access to their own properties and not others. Therefore, they can deal with their own stuff. And everything works perfectly. Are we OK with this thing? So essentially, each function of a class works based on based on the properties of that class, not other class of the same type. Again, class, structures, potatoes, potatoes. They just named it class because it's an object orientation. Object orientation refers to a structure as a class. Structure, the, see, uh, question for an interview. They ask you, what is the difference between a structure in C and structure in C++? One can hold functions, the other one cannot. Right? What is the difference between a structure and a class in C++? Absolutely no difference. OK? There is one difference between the two that we're going to come to it later on. Are we OK with this? So the first thing was encapsulation, putting the data and behavior together. The second thing, we talked about it so many times, inheritance, which means you have an already existing design of an object, a class. You create a new design out of that because you don't want to write the whole code again and you just add features to it. That's called inheritance, when a design is inheriting from another design. That's the second feature. And the third feature, we talked about it. Fly, play, fly, fly flies, pigeon flies, airplane flies, helicopter flies. They all fly, but in different ways. Now, that's the fancy name for it. There's a fancy name for it. It's called polymorphism. Polymorphism. Morph, morph means shape. Poly means many shapes, right? So it means um, an action can take different shapes based on, OK? We're going to come to it soon. So that's another thing. So you put these three things together. You put these three things together, inheritance, encapsulation, and polymorphism. You put these three things together. You have all the tools to create an object-oriented design. What makes it actually object-oriented, we call it synergy between these features, OK? You can have a car that has a steering wheel and has a gas, and gas pedal and a, and, a, and a brake and an engine, but none of them is set properly. And uh, you've got the engine of a, of a, I don't know, a Volkswagen, put it on a, on a Honda with a steering wheel or a BMW. Nothing's going to work in there. So they don't have synergy. So you have to design it in a way that all these things are utilized properly, and then you have an object-oriented program. And that's what we are teaching this semester. Are we OK with this? Are we OK? All right.
please read all these things. It says C is a subset of C++. Okay, C is a subset of C++. Anything you do, anything you have done in C, you can do in C++. Anything you have done in C, you can do in C++. C++ does more. Actually, it got its name like that. What is plus plus in C language? Add one, right? So C++ is essentially the C language with one feature added. That is object orientation. That's why they call it C++. Okay? Which all the other languages make fun of it, actually. They say because it's a postfix, it's never going to add the feature to it until it's over. <laughs> okay. So they say C++ even has a bug in its name. But no, it's its power. Yes, sir. Well, why is a little bit of C outside of a C++? Those are the deprecated stuff. Deprecated stuff. Functions that are too old and to be used. And they, uh, they are not safe and things like that. Those are the features that are very, very old. Nearly perfect superset of C, type safety. Uh, I like to talk about these things, but mm, what happens is that C language is extremely open to convert it's completely open to convert the type to another with no supervision. C++ has tried to make it a little more difficult to change a type to another while you're writing a program because that is one of the major causes of, of bug in your programs. So you will see soon that everything is more restricted in C++. It's more type safe. Okay? So again, please read, go, go through all these. Um, Read it and see if there is anything missing over here, and then uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, oh, that's a more that's a that's an important thing. Now, when you create, before doing that, let me just tell you something right offhand. Uh, maybe we can write a code for it too. So, when you create a structure a class or something. In C language, you do, in C++, you don't need to rewrite the word struct when you're instantiating it. In C language, it's not actually a new type. When you create struct something, it's not a new type. It's a package of old types. And therefore, you have to say struct employee A to re recreate a, an employee. In C++, that is not the case. In C++, you create something, it becomes a type. Which means if I say struct student and I create over here character name 21, okay? To create this, I do not need to say struct student anymore. All I need to do is to say student s. That's it. Okay? So, of course, uh, uh, so it, the, the student becomes a type that you can create and do anything you have done with types. It works the exact same way. The difference between a class and a structure in C++ is this, and I always give you this example. I know this example is extremely deprecated, but I'm going to do it, okay? Remember old times we had pay phones? Oh, no, let's do it this way. So it's not deprecated anymore. Let's go. I go to Tim Hortons, and I want to get a medium coffee, right? But what is the price for it? Anybody knows? Dollar twenty-five or something? One eighty. One eighty. One eighty. Let's say I have one fifty in my pocket and I need thirty cents. I'm your teacher. You want to get have a good impression on me and you want me to give you marks easily. So if I told you give me thirty cents to get a coffee and I'll give it back to you later, probably you would if you have the thirty cents, right? Probably you would say, "Oh, don't worry about it. I'll just pay for this one," right? Right? Most likely. But what happens if I, have the, if I want the 30 cents and I actually put my hand in your pocket and look for 30 cents in there? And you say, what the hell are you doing? I say, just I want to buy coffee. I didn't have 30 cents. I know you wouldn't mind, so I'm just going to look for it. OK? So as you see, the second one is doing well. What is the difference between the first one and second one? The outcome is the same. They both work. 
It's one of those things that it's, it's one of those things that students come to the office, used to come to the office, we don't have any office anymore, but used to come and tell me, but it works. I wrote the program. It works. Okay? That's one of the things. It works. I can go buy a TV or break somebody's window and go steal a TV. They both work. All right? I'm going to have a TV afterwards. Okay? What is wrong and what is right? When I steal a TV from someone else, someone's home, what is missing over there? What did I invade? Privacy. Privacy. Permission. Correct? That's the difference between a structure and a class. A structure is wide open. You can write s.name and do whatever you want to do with it. Change the name of the student. Do whatever you want to do with it. Wide open. But, so it's called, it's public by default. Where if I create a class employee, let's say, and I'll have over here character name, I cannot touch that one. If I write over here employee E and I say S dot name is set to whatever and if I say E dot name uh, let's do something else so I can actually put something in it. And I'm gonna have over here int age. Oh that's a new version of int by the way. Oops. Okay, so int age, and in here I'm going to have int age. By the way, this is an awful object-oriented design, okay? Because I'm creating two objects that have the exact same properties. It was supposed to be a person up there who has a name and age, and I inherited from it into a, a student and an employee, but we don't know how yet. We don't know the syntax for it, so wait. After the study break, we've got to learn how to do that, not now, okay? So keep that in mind. I don't know after or before or whatever. So, so in here, if I, if I say s.age is set to 25, it's perfectly fine. But if I say e.age set to 25, I'm in big trouble. What does it say? Member employee age declared in online is inaccessible. You cannot touch it. Class by default is private. Structure by default is public. Unless you change it. Okay? So, if I want to create something to set an age in an employee, I can write over here public. Now it's public. I can call it void set age. And in here I'm going to say int value. Okay? And in here I can say age is set to value. Okay? This is asking for the 30 cents. Employee has a set age object, sorry, method, member function that can access its age. You follow? All right, so now to go around that, I'm going to say set age. And I'm going to put 25 in here. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? That's the difference between object orientation and C language. I could not do that in C. Okay? In C++, I can actually have... Now, why do I do that? question is that, come on, just have the structure, put the, set the name, set the thing, you're writing an extra thing. The thing is that now I can actually add logic to make sure people do, do crazy stuff. What can I do over here? In that set age of mine, I can actually say, if value is less than zero, or the value is greater than, what is an impossible age? 110? No, I know 120. No, 110? 110. Let's do one. Even if you're more than 100 years old, you're not welcome to our application. Anyway, so, so, so in here, I'm going to say age is set to minus 1. 
Otherwise, I'm going to set the age to the value that I received. So now I have an intelligent type of setting that I could never have with my, with my setting the age to 25 in here. Why am I getting in? Oh, because I didn't put a semicolon in. All right? You follow what I'm saying? Now, if somebody sets the age to 200, I'll set the age to minus 1. That is a safe, empty state for your object. We call it a safe, empty stage. A detectable stage where you can see if your, your class is in an empty or an error stage. You set it that way. Say, if the age became negative, I know the guy did something stupid. OK? So, so what happens is that uh, when they set it up, you set it to minus 1. Then when you are showing an employee, you have a function called show employee or, or uh, print. And in that print thing, you see if the age is minus 1, you're going to say the object was set to an invalid value, something like that. So they know that they have done something wrong and they can go and fix it. Where in this one, if you did it that way and the thing went cuckoo, you didn't know where the problem was. Okay? So you have more control in object orientation. You can only give access to private properties of a class via public accessors, setters and getters, queries and what was the other one? I forgot. We'll find out. Anyways. Query is actually when you see what is the value, and the other one is a setter. Okay, setters and queries. Are we okay with this? Okay, we don't have a query in here, just setting it. The query is this: if I want to, like, if I want to have a query, I can write over here, uh, int get age. And in here, I'm going to say return age. Okay, so that's how I access the age. If I want to know someone's age, I'm not going to go through their social insurance number, hack it, and find out what it is. I'm going to say, well, excuse me, how old are you? Okay, by doing something like that, I'm invoking that query and actually getting the name through the thing. So in here, I'm going to say, if it's a lady, if it's more than 25, always say 25. Right? Right. Okay, so that's what we are going to do. All right. <clears throat> My mother always said that. And she's, I think, like uh, 85, so. But she's still 25 to me. OK. Are we OK? Are we OK? Are we OK? One. Are we OK? Two. Sold. Now, this one, I wanted to tell you this <clears throat> to go through another aspect that I think it's too early to mention in here, but I'm going to tell you anyway. OK? Namespaces are a little too early. We should have just said, put everything in namespace. We'll explain later on what, what it is. But when you have an object-oriented design, as I mentioned, you can look at the same object in many different ways. An employee, from the point of view of HR, human resources, has specific values and that employee from the uh, eye of the, say, management is a different thing. A car, from points of view of a mechanic, is a different beast. But driver looks at a car in a, many diff in a completely different way. So if you are creating a car for a driver, an object for a car for a driver. There are so many things that you did not mention, you do not mention. Only things that a driver needs to know. But when you are creating an object of car for a mechanic, then it's a completely different story. You have to bring up specifics that a mechanic needs to know. The person who wants to repair a car, correct? Now, if we are creating a company, let's say we call it Ford Company, and we want to design a system for Ford Company. Each Ford Company has the place that they sell their cars, right? We create an object of called car, so we call this thing sales, OK? So for the sales department, if I create a car, I give specific information that you need to give an, uh, to a customer for the car, right? But when I go to the design department of Ford and I create a car, they may have similar things, but this car is an absolutely different thing. 
it has the thickness of the armor in front of the thing and the, the I don't know, crash test uh, coefficient when it hits from the side and the things that you never mention to a customer. Okay? Now, I have two classes, both name car. What the heck am I supposed to do? If I compile my program, it's going to tell me, hey, you already have a class called car. What are you doing? I cannot compile this. I cannot have two classes with the same name. It doesn't make sense. That's when namespaces come to play. Zero, 01. This is class versus struct. Hopefully, it's going to put dot .cpp after it, will it? Dot .cpp. Oh, dot .cpp. Dot .cpp. All right. So this is how you see the notes. So I put 0, 1, so you, you'll see the progress of notes as I go through. Then I close this one, and I open the, the program again, and I write the next thing in it. So, so when you know already what modules are, right? And you know that the code gets compiled, all the modules get together and get compiled at once, right? So assume that I am writing two different modules over here. So the sales department is having a class called car, right? That does something, okay? That is whatever salesperson needs, right? And then we have another department creating a class car. What should I call that thing? Manufacturing department. The manufacturing department, whatever manufacturing department needs. Right? But when I do something like this, I'm going to have problem. There are two, diff two classes with the same name. Whenever something like that happens, I create namespaces. I'm going to say, hey, development team for the sales department, anything you create should be in a namespace called sales. So when they are writing, a, where they are creating a car over here, they're going to create their car in a namespace sales. And when the manufacturing is creating it, it creates a namespace man. Okay? Now, when you want to create an instance of a car, because they are both the uh, same name, you have to qualify it. You have to say, I want to create an instance of sales car. Let's call it SC. And I want to create an instance of type manufacturing car SC. So I have two different types of things. Just so when you include sales.h, then everything from sales will come through. Okay? So if I wanted to write this properly, I would have actually have, I'm not going to create it. This is going to be in sales.h file. This is going to be in man.h car. Okay, so when I'm using this over and over, let's say I'm writing a main and I'm 90% of the time I'm going to deal with the manufacturing part and only 10% I'm going to deal with the sales part of the car. So I'm writing an application that's going to find out what is the total cost of a car. So it has to go through all the manufacturing features of a car. And then when it finds out what the cost is, simply writes, creates an instance of the sales car and puts the price over there. That's it. If I want to do that, most of the time I want to deal with a manufactured car, correct? So I don't want to keep writing man scope resolution, man scope resolution, man scope. I don't want to do that. I want to just write car. If I want to do that, I can say over here, using namespace man. If that's the case, any place that you just put car, it means a manufacturer's car. 
unless you qualify it. OK? Why do we write name using namespace STD? C++ did not have a namespace long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. We did not have a namespace. Then they added the feature of namespace to, to C++. Where do all the standard things supposed to go? In the STD namespace. So all the stuff that we have from the language goes into the STD namespace. And because we use it a lot, we write using namespace STD. Otherwise, you had to mention STD scope resolution C out. STD scope resolution C in. STD scope. Because we don't do that, we, we want to just use the standard stuff most of the time, we write using namespace STD. Are we OK with this? Are we OK with namespaces? Yes, sir. Oh, because I'm an idiot. Okay? One of it is not SC, one of it is not CC. Oh, MC, actually. Thank you. Thank you for one person who like, everybody was okay with that, with the same name for the thing, really? No, uh, you, you, you were just waiting, right? Okay, sorry, I made a mistake. So the names has to be different, duh. Otherwise, <laughs> like, uh, of course. Okay, but it's the type that you qualify. Thank you very much. That was just. Uh, uh, mistake that I made. So I ca I'll call that MC, of course. That's a manufacturing car. Okay? Are we okay with this? Are we okay? One? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. You can use a using namespace. That's right. That's very. Yes, yes. OK. There is one golden rule for using namespace that you need to follow. There is one golden rule. You are not allowed to use a namespace in a header file. Why? Because the sky is high. I'll explain later. OK? You can. A compiler won't get you a mistake. But it opens your code to extreme amount of confusion and bug. Don't. OK? Because people will add a header file without knowing that they are using a namespace now. OK? They designed the class called car, and now they are included manufacturing, and suddenly manufacturing is used now. So whenever they say car, it's actually going to the manufacturer. It's going to give them a, uh, a collision error. So they think you're creating two classes with the same name. I didn't create it. I just created a class car. There is no second one. They didn't know there is one in the manufacturing, right? So remember that. Never use a namespace in a header file. Always qualify your objects. Always put scope resolution in it. Are we OK with this? OK. So again. This using namespace STD, I'm going to bring it up where it belongs, which is here. All right. So I'm going to mention it over here. Remember not to use a namespace, namespace, if I can type it, space in a header file. OK? Are we OK with this? Are we OK? One. Two, and so. When does the class end? Two seconds. Mm. Anybody knows I'm going through my car? 1230 12, ends, right? So we have 35 minutes. Five minutes break and we come back. OK, five minutes break. And please remind me to unpause. All right, let's come back to our list of stuff that we wanted to talk about. So we talked about inheritance. Like I went through all these things. So the second one that is says, what is object terminology? You know what it is. Um, come next, next time with questions and be ready for the quiz. So uh, compilation stuff, it's done in every single thing. I'm going to tell you what a module is, and then we're going to go through it, uh, uh, the rest of the things quickly. So modular programming 
you already know what it is because you've done it in IPC 144. I'm going to tell you with respect of a class and in a workshop you're going to learn how the C have done it. Okay? So essentially modular programming was to put everything that is relative to, to um, a topic, uh, a point of interest, on, all in one file and then have several files in our program and each file that wants to use another file includes its header file. Okay? Um, let me pause recording for a second. All right, so essentially, uh, anybody over here having problem with colors? Okay. There's a very high percentage of people who cannot recognize colors. So because I want to mention, I want to see should I do one, two, three, I can say red, green, blue, okay? So if anybody has problem with colors, let me know and I'll... Okay. I should actually do that these days because of the privacy thingy in, uh, uh, in an email, probably. But anyway, so um, this is how a compiler works. So this is how the modules work. So you have different modules. In our system, for now, the, the rule that we have is that you have, for each class that you create, you create one module. Okay? There are exceptions for that that will come later on that my friend asks over there about uh, class being fully private. Uh, but uh, we, uh, for now, any class that we create, it has its own module. So I have three classes in this case. I create module blue, module red, and module green for it. And I create blue.cpp for class blue. I do red.cpp for, uh, for class red. And I do uh, green.cpp for uh, my green class. And each one of them, it has a header file. So essentially, that's blue.h, red.h, and green.h. Brown doesn't need one because it's the main. It uses everything else. Nobody's using it. If it did, it needs a header file, but it doesn't. Okay? If it has prototypes and things that it needs, it can put it in itself. It doesn't need to have a header file to get included because nobody's using it. Okay? So... What happens is that, let's say that, uh, oh, so compiler works like this. Compiler, when you actually compile the command that you write, you wrote, you wrote GCC, then you wrote the name of the first file, .c, then the second file, .c, the third file. So you put four files over there and you hit enter. Actually, compiler runs to the number of your modules. So compiler actually runs four times in here. First, it compiles first one individually by itself. So first, the blue one gets compiled. Make sure everything's there. References are there. And then it creates an object file of it. Let's call it blue object file, blue.o or obj. Then red gets compiled by itself, and the red object gets created. Then green is getting called. But green is using some of the features of red. That's why it's including the red header file in it. Because of that, when it gets compiled, it just has a notification because it's using the functions of red or features of red. There is a guarantee you're telling to the compiler, hey, the red stuff are there. Trust me. Just compile the code. Make the calls. When the time comes, they're going to be here. I promise. It's as if I tell you, down in library, there are tutors that they're going to help you with C++. Don't worry. If you have a problem, go there. That's include tutor.h. <laughs> okay? I just included that. So when you compile, you say, okay, thank you. So if I have a problem, I'll go there. That's when you make the object. And then I'll go in the uh, brown one, exactly the same thing. Everything is used. There are two problems over here. First of all, because red is already included in green, okay, behind the scene, it's going to get included twice in my brown, correct? Correct? Because it's, it's in, without knowing, it's including green, right? And it wants to use the red feature, so it includes red without knowing that red is actually already included in green, right? Compiler is going to give you an error. 
How do we fix that? Like this. So first, let's, let's say I'm creating a class called car. What do I do for that class car? I create a header file. What I do, the first thing, I, the hashtags that you see is you talking to compiler. You are telling to compiler to do such and such before compilation. Any hashtag, it means compiler. It has nothing to do with C language. For example, when you write include, you are telling to compiler, go copy that file and paste it here before compilation. Literally. It literally means that. Okay? So in here you are saying, if that phrase is not defined, define it. What is that phrase? It's a unique name that you're going to give to your header file based on the standards of your organization. Okay? So we are in SDDS school, so I'm going to say that name should start with SDDS underline. Then use the capital letters of the header file you are creating. So if it's car.h, it becomes car underline h all capitals and then two underlines after. That's the rule in my class. Okay? So you create that, you put it at the first line. The second line you say, if it's not defined, continue compilation. But the first thing you're going to do, define it. Define it to what? We don't care. It just defines it. It defines it, and that's the end of my if for my compiler. So when compiler, the first time it's defining, it's, it's asked, is, a car that is, is car underline h defined? No. So continue compiling, but it defines it, right? The second time it gets included, it says, is car.h defined? Yes, it is. So stop compiling. So what happens if you, comp if you include this 50 times, only the first time it gets compiled. The rest is completely ignored. That is called the safeguard for a, for a, for a header file. And you are to do that for every single header file that you are writing from now till the day you die. After that, you can do whatever you want. But before that, you have to do this. Safeguards for all header files. Okay? Number two, because we are in Seneca organization, we have to have all our work in the namespace SDDS. That's a rule. So any header file, any code that you generate from now till the end of OOP244 will be in namespace. SDDS. There was something that I did not mention about a namespace. If you have two classes with the same name, you get a compiler, correct? If you have two namespaces with the same name, they join and they create a bigger namespace. Okay? So two same namespaces, they join. Two same class names, conflict. That's why any code you are writing, you put SDS to make sure that in your code you are not repeating any name. Okay? So everything that we do is going to be on that one. So that takes care of, takes care of that twice red.h being included because we add a safeguard to it. Then, after everything is done, that command line calls a program called linker. What does linker do? Linker goes through every single object and checks to see if promises made are actually kept. Which means if you said that in here that there is a red object that does stuff, is the red object there? And then packs them all together in one file called schmigglydingy.exe, which is your executable. So the name of the project, whatever it is. Okay? In Linux, there is no extension for it. It's just tagged to be executable. But in Windows, because it's backboard compatible with 95 years ago, it has .exe at the end. Okay? So that's what it is. And that's how compilers work. That's how modular stuff works. And that's how we create our module. So when you are creating, let's say we are creating this car thingy, what do we do? We do all the car thingy over here, and then we say, okay, I want, the car, I want to be able to set a car to values. One thing, another rule that we have. The variables you, oh, by the way, this structure is not a structure anymore. It's a class now. Why? Because I put a private tag underneath it. A class is private, pri uh, private by default, right? Because I did struct card and I put private underneath, it's as if I wrote class. 
because I'm crazy, I don't want, I want to type extra stuff. Otherwise, we don't need to do that. Okay, so instead of doing all these, I could have simply said struct so, ah, class car. Okay, and just comment these. There you go. So these two are equivalent. I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't need to write that anymore. I'm going to say same as class. So question for your quiz. What is the difference between a class and a structure? You have to say by default. by default. Okay, anything. I, if I write a class and I write public, then it becomes public. So it's not that it's private. It's private by default. You can always change it. Put a tag and that's what it's going to be. Okay? Public, private. We have a third one called protected. Okay? Private, public, protected. Protected, as its name, name comes through it, it's private but less private. Okay? Like, protected is like, Again, I'm going to give you that awful example. Is my father has a car, right? The, the car is protected, which means my neighbor cannot just come and go through it. But I can borrow my father's car. So for me, that is his son, it's accessible, right? Protected is that. So when you have something protected, your, if you ch your children can use it, but strangers can't, okay? That's what protected is. So, but we don't go through it now. Well, anyways, so that's it. So if I want to set this car class car to thingy, I can call it set, and in here call make, uh, say uh, character, sorry, constant character pointer make. Oh, wait a minute. Make, make. Ugh, I don't want that, OK? So there is another regulation that we have in here, is that any member variable that in object orientation is called an attribute. Remember, attribute. Attribute means a variable that is a member of a class or a structure. Attribute. So any member variable or attribute started with M underline. Why? Because it's good for your health. That's all. Okay? It reduces the conflict and stuff. There is a way to, to get over with that. But anyways. Uh, so set, make. Const character pointer model. So make it a model of a car and const character license plate, pointer license plate. Okay? And I put a semicolon at the end. Now, you have seen, why is it giving me an error in here? Oh, my apologies. <laughs> All right. So, you have seen in C language, and many professors who write stuff, is something that I do not like. When they write a prototype, they don't, they don't write the names of the variables in here. That's a bad thing to do. Although it works, just imagine. If I do this only, how the heck you know which one is what? It works, but it's awful. You can write over here anything you want. It doesn't matter. Be as descriptive as you can. The make. It doesn't matter. Okay? The model. And come to new line. Don't be afraid of going to new line. And over here, call it the license plate. Be as descriptive as you can. Later, you, you will thank me for this. Make this your habit. You will thank me 10 years from now. When you write a program, you sell it to someone. Three years later, they come back and tell you it has a bug here. And you have to go through your own code, find out what the heck you have done seven years ago. OK? So that's the time that this comes handy. And do it, I'm telling you, OK? So then, if you want, now, and now, so it says set is here, but I want to put the implementation of set inside the car.cpp. It's a module, right? So that's where the prototype goes. Now, if I want to actually do the set, now I'll go to car.cpp. In here, I'm going to say include car.h. Of course, I am saying namespace. 
S D D S. I'm not using it. I am in it. Main program uses S D D S. I am writing it. Remember that. Okay? You don't use it. You write it. You implement it. Now in here, I'm going to say set. But who this set belongs to? Car. And now in here, I can do whatever I want. So probably some copying is involved. So I'm going to include another thing you need to know. What was the name of the file that does work with, with, uh, with uh, uh, C, C stuff, C string? It's string header file, right? Anything that you had in C language with a dot H at the end, drop the dot H, stick a C at the beginning. So string dot H becomes C string. Okay? So if you want to use it, you say include C string. For all those people who know how st string object in C++ works, you use it, I'll kill you. Okay? Don't do it for now. Okay? Don't go ahead and understand the object orientation and then use it. Okay? I'll let, I'll, we'll come to it. Was that a question? Oh, let me take a pose. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But, but anyways, these are all on, the, on, uh, on YouTube and, 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 and GitHub. So, so now if I want to actually, and, and of course, I can use that C string is from the old days, so it's going to be using namespace std. And in here now, I'm going to say str copy, str n copy into uh, M underline. That's a good thing. When I say M underline, automatically all the member stuff comes out so I can see them. So IntelliSense becomes more easy to use. So I'll go M underline. Those are the stuff. So I want to copy the make. I'm going to go select make over here. There you go. Make and then copy the make to it. Oh, the make. And uh, what is the count for it? Now I'm going to come over here, split my window in two, take this thing off, so I can actually see the specs of my class while I'm implementing it over here. So it's going to be 30 characters. And of course, I'm going to say m make 30 is set to 0 to make sure it's null terminated. And I can continue with the rest of them, OK, to set them. So this set, wait, wait, wait uh, okay, I'm waiting. Um, uh, when you have to do it before you do the string copy? Huh? When you have to do it before you do the string copy, set it to zero? So if you want to walk to a wall, first you get to a wall and then go there. First you copy, then you point the end, right? That just guarantees, that just guarantees, because SDRN copy, what does S What does the SDR copy do? You can say pass if you don't want to say it, but go ahead. <laughs> My lady. <laughs> from one string to another, right? Copies from values from one string to another, and then? What is the definition of a string in C language? No, no. Give me the full sentence. OK, and loud. OK, go ahead. We don't have time. String is a combination of characters that ends with. So let's put it in proper words. A string, back there, sitting far, a string is an array of character whose end is marked with a null byte. A string is a string of characters whose end is marked with a null byte. Okay? We don't have strings in C language. That's why they created this standard. Okay? What does a string copy do? It copies the characters from one character array to the other one, keeps going until it hits the null byte, and then it copies the null byte. That's string copy. SDRN copy works exactly like a string copy unless it hits the size. So if it's below 30, it's going to copy everything from the make into mmake and null terminate mmake. Fine. 
But if somebody puts a make that is longer than 30, it's going to copy from the make to a make, and it will not null terminate that one. That's why to make sure I'll null terminate it anyway. If this is further than the actual size, if the make was only 10 characters, eh, who cares? There is a null, and there is a null after, after that. Who cares? But if there is none, then it guarantees that it's null terminated. That's all. Okay? And we've got to do that for all the things, for model and license plate and everything. So it's going to set everything, and that's the set for it. So this is how it's done. Uh, of course, I have to do the rest of the stuff. It's 26. Um, it literally, so next class start as 1235, right? That would be the case for time. OK, I have to look at my schedule. Are you forcing me to actually look at my schedule? That's what you're doing, right? Uh, where is my schedule? Anybody knows where my schedule? Um, I always have problem with that. I have. I just want to make sure that. Yeah, perfect. So I have three minutes. I wasted two of it by looking for the thing. All right, so now you see this thingy. It means, hey, you wrote it, but you don't have the implementation for it in the, in the, uh, in the, project, in the project. But if you save this, then hopefully that's going to go away. OK? So now I have uh, the module created, OK? Of course, I have to complete all the things that I want to do. But again, remember, that's how a module is created. OK? And then in the main, in the main program, you want to use that thing. In, the, in main, you say include. If you can type it, of course, include car.h. And now I'm going to say using namespace SDDS. Now I can say over here car C, C dot set to Tesla model 3 and license plate is ABC 1, 2, 3. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? All right, that's it. So that's a module and how modules are created. We can have 50 of these added, and uh, um, our system is going to work perfectly. And that's it. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Two days. Two days after, and do it yourself is three days after that. So five days after. I don't know. Whatever it is, whatever your 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 whatever, the, when it comes up, go through the submitter. Okay, just type slash submit, and then put workshop and then dash do. It tells you lists everything for you. Okay, that's the easiest way. If I tell you something and I change something, then I'm. You had a question that I wanted. What is the difference between a class and an object? What is the difference between a class and an object? Can anybody tell me? Huh? Yes, she said class is the group of objects. But yes, but no. Yes, in English, yes, but in object orientation, no. Cr class is a structure for object. Perfectly correct, but not correct terminology. Hmm? With the same structure. With, um, okay. Objects are instances of a class. Okay? Objects are instances of a class. All right? Fardad is an object of type teacher. Int i. Int is the class. i is the object. Object is when you create a class and bring it to, to existence. OK? An object is something that you can deal with. A class is only an idea. 
Okay? A class is the design. The object is making something out of that design. Are we good? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Sold. I'll put this thing up and uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to post the, the draft version of lab uh, as soon as possible.